Good morning, Joy class. Uh, I'm Scott. Uh, some of you may have expected uh, Jeff. Uh, he contacted me a little bit, uh, well, uh, sometime yesterday, and apparently he, he's under the weather. Uh, so we want to um, keep him in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, being a good God. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we can always count on you. Uh, in the midst of trouble and uh, when we're having tough times, Lord, thank you that you are interested in in our lives and, and help us, Lord, uh, to um, um, just know, uh, Lord, that you are with us. Uh, help us to learn something about you today. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, I have to be honest with you. Um, I'm not much of a golfer. Um, actually, uh, my dad uh, invited me to go uh, golfing with him about 15 years ago, and he has not invited me back. <laughs> I was that bad. Uh, but I, one of the things that I, I used to do, uh, well, I, actually, I guess I did once or twice, um, they don't make golf balls uh, the way that they used to. Uh, but back in the day, back a long time ago, um, you could actually take a golf ball and cut it in half, or start peeling the out the hard outer core of it back, and what you would find was a very tightly knit network of rubber bands. And once you started pulling back the cover of the golf ball, one of the things that would happen if you got one that was really tightly wound was it would just start kind of unraveling really quickly on its own. You wouldn't even have to pull back uh, the rubber bands um, at, at all. And you know, today I think they have some kind of um, specialized plastic or some, some other material that they've substituted those. Uh, but a long time ago, once you, uh, you know, the way they would manufacture a golf ball was that they'd uh, have a little core and they would just wrap a lot of tightly knit rubber bands around it. And once you took that cover off, if you were uh, curious like I was, uh, it would actually start coming apart. The rubber bands would start bouncing or start almost kind of vibrating as they unraveled themselves. Uh, I promise a, a connection to our lesson. Uh, today, we are uh, starting a new lesson uh, called, uh, this, this is Why Do I Need the Church? And lesson one is We Are Joined Together. And I was thinking we're, we're heading into a, um, a session where we're going to talk about um, the church life and, and how we are, um, how that's important uh, to Christians. And I was thinking about how that sort of relates to the, that golf ball. Uh, you know, once we are, uh, if we are tightly knit, if we are bound together, uh, we have a purpose and we function well. Uh, you know, if you're uh, the golf, going back to the golf ball analogy, um, you know, hopefully if you have a good swing, once you make contact with the ball, and if it has those rubber bands still intact, it'll go a long way. Uh, like I said, if you're like me, it'd probably veer off into the woods somewhere. However, once those rubber bands started unraveling, uh, it lost its purpose. And so these lessons uh, that we're hard, uh, getting ready to go into are going to tell us really how to stay uh, in, a, in a situation uh, where we can stay cohesive with the church and really fulfill our, our purpose the way that God intended. Otherwise, we'll become unraveled and lose uh, the purpose that we were, we were meant for. So let's go ahead and uh, start reading. Uh, this is in Ephesians 1. 20 through 23, and it says, He exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as um, and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which in, is his body, so the church is his body, the fullness of the one who feels all things in every way. So some things that jumped out at me when uh, I was reading through this, and again, this whole uh, session is about how we interact with each other in the church. And so the first thing in verse 20 uh, that, that I noticed was that he exercised his power 
And, you know, when I started reading that, the, the thing that came to my mind was, you know, God is a God of action. Uh, he just didn't kind of sit back and, and, and wait for things to happen. God had a plan, and he took action on that plan. And not only did he take action on that plan, what happened, uh, and in this case, his sole, perfect, uh, his sole purpose was to benefit us with salvation. And in, in verse 20, it says, He exercised his power in Christ by raising him from the dead. So in other words, he took action, he took initiative, he took um, upon himself to do something that he didn't need to do, and that was to die for our sins and to be raised up again. And we should also be that action-oriented. I have a tendency to get uh, lazy when it comes to uh, some things. I say, well, somebody else would do it, or someone, um, you know, that's not my problem. Uh, but God, uh, his, you know, his purpose for us is to be a people of action. And that can take a lot of different forms. And I have a couple of verses here uh, that I wanted to read. The first one is in Isaiah one, uh, let's see, hopefully I've got it marked here. Yeah, Isaiah 1, 17, and it says, Learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. So the first thing that you know we can say that the church's purpose is is to look out for those who can't look out for themselves. Um, maybe there's someone inside the church that falls into that category. Maybe it's someone outside of the church who falls in that category. Regardless of where they are, it's the Christian's responsibility to take action. Uh, just like uh, God took action in exercising uh, his power to do something wonderful for us, we're supposed to also turn around and take action on the behalf of others. In Matthew, twenty-five. This is Matthew twenty-five, starting on verse thirty-four. And it says, the king will say to those on his right hand, and we'll come back uh, in, in a few minutes and, and talk about that idea of being on uh, the right hand. It says, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for, uh, for you from the foundation of the world. <clears throat> for I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you look, took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when, when, did we, uh, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When, when did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of, of these, my brethren, you did it uh, to me. So I think the, the good news is there, there's plenty for us to do. Uh, there's plenty of us both inside and outside of the church uh, to impact people, to impact society. Uh, but also notice that Christ, he associates himself with, uh, with, with those that don't have anything. For those who you know, maybe are considered uh, less fortunate or something that um, you know, in a lot of cases we maybe uh, strive to avoid. And, and Christ actually took the initiative he took the action to say, I am one of these. And in fact, if you want, um, you know, this, uh, if you want to please me, you should act in this manner to take action where uh, it's needed and to help those. And that's the part of Christ that I think that we, um, we have to make sure that people see. Um, once you, you have to meet people's needs before they'll listen to anything else that you have to say. <clears throat> All right, let's go on to um, verse 21. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, stay on, on verse 20. It says, um, and seating him at his right hand in the heavens. And really, you know, it's uh, more than a physical place. I, I guess at some point it probably did have some kind of physical meaning um, when, when kings were, uh, you know, mostly in power, I guess. Uh, but basically the right hand, when we're talking about here, it means a place of importance, um, a place of, in, of influence. And uh, is it, you know, the, the question I have written down here is, you know, what is on our right hand? We know that God uh, has given us the ability to be on his right hand. In other words, he, he wants to bring us up uh, from, 
you know, a life that maybe we have known previously to something that is uh, righteous, something that is close to him. Um, and so, you know, we are important to him. But what is, an, what is on our right hand? Um, it could be a lot of different things uh, that we have that we have, uh, imp- have given importance to instead of Christ. Uh, in verse 21, it says, uh, far above every ruler, and it goes on. Um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And and so, uh, you know, we should look for Christ to be our guide. Um, and I was thinking about everything that uh, maybe we give um, attention to, maybe everything uh, that we give um, as a power or as a... Um, uh, position of influence in our life, uh, and we have to remember that when we follow Christ, and this goes to you know as well as how we uh, conduct ourselves outside of the church, but definitely within the within the church as well. It's not a um, something that we should be guided uh, by a, a you know a position or a specific doctrine, um, not an organization. It's really easy to get swept up, uh, swept up, uh, swept up in those things, uh, but Christ should be our ultimate guide. And so, if we have our faith in a person, um, if we have our faith in a position, if we have, a, um, if we get stuck on a particular uh, doctrine, or if we get, um, you know, stuck on a specific organization, whether it be a local or a national organization, all those things will let us down. All those things uh, take our mind off of Christ, and they take our our concentration also off of Christ. And once we get trained on something else other than Christ, we should be, um, we'll, we're destined to, to, to fall short of where we should be. Now, all these things, you know, position, and doctrines, and organizations, all those uh, are important, uh, but they should be supportive. They should be in a support role and not take our eyes off the main goal, and that is uh, following Christ. Let's look at verse 22, and it says, And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church. Uh, first of all, I guess, you know, he, he subjected everything. You know, we, we serve an all-powerful God, um, and I'm, I'm glad that not only is he all-powerful, but he is all-gracious as well. Um, I mess up every day. Um, <laughs> I mess up every minute, it seems like, and I'm very thankful that God even has the power to forgive sin. Uh, and, uh, you know, let's turn this really, um, you know, from a discussion about, um, you know, God's all powerfulness, all those that that's true. Remember, our objective is to be Christ like. And it says he subjected everything under his feet. You know, what what have we not given to Christ? Uh, what part of our life have we not uh, given to him? It says that um, and he subjected everything under his feet. But part of that is our choice. Part of that is the fact that we have uh, things in our life that probably aren't productive, that aren't uh, uh, conducive to, to leading a, a Christian life. What part of those have we not given to Christ? Um, it could be a lot of different things. Uh, and again, um, you know, I just wrote down a couple of things that we may have a tendency not to give over to God. And remember that that's a sign, really, of disobedience um, and, and not giving uh, God power or, or a rule over our lives. Um, it could be a disagreement that we've had with others, uh, especially, um, uh, you know, for, for things that, that maybe don't have eternal value. Um, you know, how, how important are, the, are we, uh, how, por- how important is it us to win an argument? Um, how important is us to, to, to show people that we are right and, and maybe they're wrong? That's something that can hinder our relationship with others and with Christ. Is it something that's, that's material? Do we have our eye on uh, something uh, that we want to purchase or um, that we want to have or we want to accumulate? Uh, do we have some kind of prejudice in our life? Uh, do we hold things against people because of where they're from or where they or what they look like? Um, you know, is um, maybe it's a position that we're after. Uh, maybe it's the way we react to things. Uh, maybe we get um, angry. Uh, maybe we tend to lash out at people. Um, what you know, it could be something like, what if we um, are worried about or we're anxious uh, about the future? 
all those things really come uh, into play in really separating us from God. And in verse 22, it says he subjected everything under his feet. And really that starts with us in that we have a choice whether to subject, uh, subject these things. And it's not an exclusive um, uh, it's not a, an exhaustive list. Uh, there could be, um, you know, insert your uh, vice here or insert your uh, thing that you struggle with on a daily basis here. Uh, I just listed a couple of those. Um, but, you know, at what point do we take what is um, giving us trouble and we really subject that to what God wants to do with that? Are we giving him room to work with us, give a give room to him to improve us, uh, to really, um, and, and we'll talk about, um, you know, what God's plans are for us later, but those are things that we need to give to God to make sure that this verse is actually true, that we have submitted everything to God so he can have that, um, have that rule over our lives. Verse 23 uh, says, uh, which is his body, the fullness of the one who feels all things in every way. Um, and so really the church here, and this is, I guess, getting to, to, to what we're, uh, this whole series is about. Uh, the church has a special purpose, and it is, says it's a body. And there's a couple of things that, that I wrote down uh, when we think about the, the body. You know, uh, we think probably about movement, um, maybe about exercise or, or something like that. So the church should be a, a church of action. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, the church, um, you know, the body takes maintenance. Uh, you have to feed it. You have to uh, exercise it. You have to make sure you get enough sleep. Uh, you have to do a lot of things just to take care of, of yourself. And the church is like that as well. There are certain things that we have to do to make sure the church is healthy, uh, you know, you know coming together, uh, even though maybe it let me, uh, maybe uh, virtually uh, in this case, uh, but there are a lot of things that we have to do to make sure that we are in tune with God enough that we serve his purpose uh, as a church. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, you know, I think we've talked about this quite a bit uh, in the past, is that really it says, you know, everything for the church, which is the body, there are a lot of different body parts that serve a lot of different purposes. There are ears, noses, and mouths, and, and feet, and things like that. And we can view ourselves that way, that we all have a different perspective. Uh, we all have different experience. Uh, sometimes that experience is good, sometimes it's bad, but we bring that into the church. Uh, we have different um, skill sets. Uh, we have different ministries, and God is uh, can use anything that we bring to the table. In a lot of cases, He can not only develop the things that we bring to the table, but He can give us new gifts as well. Um, the last thing uh, in verse twenty three, it says, "The fullness of the one who feels all things in every way." So He's talking about really how the church is a way to fulfill a lot of His plan. Um, but really, when I read the last part of verse twenty three, um, the fullness of the one who feels all things, and I, and I think you know, <laughs> the first thing that actually came to my mind was you know when I get hungry and I eat and just how you know content I feel uh, and that's really uh, something that we, we should take uh, advantage of uh, that Christ has offered us especially uh, with so much uncertainty going around uh, that uh, God is, is, is someone who wants to uh, make sure that we have peace and, and can give us the fullness uh, that he's promised. Uh, I want to read something this is probably um, you probably know this by heart uh, but this is in Psalm 23 and this is the first um, this is I think really goes along with this idea of being fulfilled being content um, <clears throat> being uh, in a place of just uh, peace where God uh, can 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 be in our hearts <clears throat> So this is Psalm 23. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. And you know, I guess that's the first thing before even we get to that. We have to make sure that Christ is our shepherd. Uh, and it goes on. It says, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yeah, I think those are uh, good words for, for maybe uncertain times. And, um, you know, that God's aim, regardless of what goes around, it says, you know, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you know, some some place that's you know very uncomfortable for us, uh, some place that uh, brings a lot of uncertainty to us, uncertainty to us, a lot of anxiousness, a lot of nervousness, a lot of worry. God is there to give us that contentment and that peace. It doesn't mean things will necessarily turn out the way we envisioned, but uh, God is there to make sure that we have that peace and faith in Him. <clears throat> Let's go on to. The next uh, se- uh, section, uh, this is Ephesians um, chapter 2, 8 through 10. Uh, and it says, For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Uh, when I was reading this, um, in, you know, in verse 8, uh, verse um, Eight and nine, I kind of put those together uh, when I was reading this. Uh, you know, it can't be purchased. Uh, it talks about the um, for you're saved by grace. Uh, it can't be purchased. Um, it can't be um, negotiated. It can't say if I do this, you'll do this, uh, uh, or you know, if you do this, I'll do this for you. Uh, it can't be earned, um, and you know, it's just a free gift. That's why it's called grace. Uh, it's free. Um, we can't do anything to earn it. We can't do uh, put anything, um, you know, we can't uh, put enough works out there uh, to pay for it. Uh, and so our, the grace is uh, free and it's a, it's a gift. Um, it's hard, for, I think, for us, especially maybe in our society that we live today, uh, <clears throat> you know, you, there's a saying, you get what you pay for um, or nothing's for free. Uh, but this is one of the few things that we can say is totally free, uh, and it just happens to be the most important thing. And so this is something that we can't do on our own. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> the thing that I think is interesting about that, if we were able to, to do this through works, um, you know, works are important. Um, you know, faith without works is dead. Um, but it's a sign, it's a symbol of, of, of something else that's already happened. Uh, but it's important uh, that we realize that if, if we were uh, concentrating on works or earning our way, um, you know, to, to a place where we could, uh, where Christ wants us to be, uh, that would take the, that would take the um, sort of the, uh, uh, the, the spotlight, if you will, off of Christ, and it would put us on ourselves. And that's where it doesn't need to be. It needs to be pointing to Christ. And that's why I think God offer that us for free in part is a free gift we can see his graciousness we can see his uh, love for us but also we can uh, you know it's it's also saying that there's nothing that we can do uh, to earn that uh, in verse 10 it says uh, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared ahead of time for us to do uh, and I was thinking about uh, this idea of workmanship um, and, uh, you know, what that kind of, some of the things that, that kind of uh, go along with that meaning. Um, and then this is, you know, something what, what Christ is trying to do in our lives. He's trying to uh, shape us, mold us, uh, trying to get us in, to, to a place to, that's hopefully a finished product, although we, we, we won't reach that. Um, and, you know, some of the things that, that uh, I think uh, kind of go along with that word of workmanship, um, it takes time. Um, in a lot of cases, um, uh, it may, you know, not because of any fault of, of Christ, but because of our own fault, we ha- may need to scrap uh, a lot of the things that we've invested in and just start over. Um, and I'm thankful that Christ is willing to always start over for us, not only to, on, only on a daily basis, but all, it seems like on a minute by minute basis. Um, I was I was making a shelf, uh, just a little shelf uh, for uh, Joanna and Abby uh, for their little playhouse out back. And I got so aggravated uh, because no matter what I did, I split the wood. And-
And, um, you know, I think, you know, this idea of this workmanship is that we can try so hard. We can try to earn it. We can do try to do things our way. But in a lot of times what happens is God wants us to step back from that. I had to take a break from it and say, I'll work on this tomorrow. And actually tomorrow uh, was a lot better day as far as that was concerned. But we have to step back a lot of times and rely on God's timing, rely on his plan, and rely on what he wants to do. <clears throat> Uh, the second thing is, uh, you know, this takes planning. Um, we talk about workmanship, and God has a plan. Um, I have a tendency to, if I get into a project, I think Becky um, can vouch for this, is that I kind of just jump into it. Um, and, I, and she's a much better planner than I am. Uh, if I need something from Lowe's, I'll go get it when I need it. Uh, she will calculate everything uh, down to the square footage uh, of every single board and uh, count the number of screws needed. Um, but really, it, when we look at this I have a, uh, idea of a workmanship, um, th it takes a plan. Uh, regardless of the extent of the plan or, or how detailed it is, it does take a plan. And so if we are God's workmanship, uh, that means that God has a plan for us. And, you know, it, you know his plan is a lot better than ours. Uh, his plan is something that um, you know is uh, always has our best interest in heart and we can only see part of it what's right in front of us and we don't understand or a lot of times can't handle um, you know what the, the ultimate goal is for us um, you know something else uh, usually when you build something with workmanship it's functional it has a purpose um, you usually don't just uh, build something to um, you know <laughs> to have no purpose. Sometimes that purpose is for other people to get enjoyment out of it. Uh, you know, if it's a piece of art, um, you know, maybe, um, you know, its purpose is to, you know, bring a sense of calm to people or a sense of curiosity to people. If it's a piece of furniture, it's for maybe something to, to sit in or to uh, store something in. Uh, but there's usually a purpose, and we have to realize that God has a purpose for our life, not only. Um, you know, to, to help people, to, um, you know, show Christ's love to other people, uh, but also uh, he has a, a purpose for us inside of the church to fulfill something. Um, and I was thinking, uh, the last thing, usually in the off chance uh, that my workmanship um, uh, turns out to be uh, something good, it's something that I'm proud of. Uh, it's something that I might take a picture of and show it to somebody and say, look what I built or uh, look what city you're sitting on. I remember when I built that. And I was thinking about, you know, if we are Christ's workmanship, um, is he proud of us? Um, is, have we uh, allowed him uh, to, to be so prominent in our life or, or at least, um, you know, work with our heart so much? Is it something that he's proud of and can say, he's my child or she is my child? Um, is it something that uh, they are, um, you know, is, is, he, is he proud to identify with us? Um, is he, can he say, look, I took this person, this was where he was or uh, where she was, and this is where that person is now. Um, and so can we say that? Um, can we say that we have given Christ control over our lives to that extent? Um, there's a, a verse in Philippians, and this is another very well-known verse. This is Philippians 1.6, uh, and it says, <clears throat> Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful that, um, you know, he, he's a uh, patient. Um, he is willing to uh, take time with us. He's willing, like we talked about just a few minutes ago, he's willing for us to, um, you know, take a while. Uh, maybe we have to, maybe we mess up to the point where we uh, have to scrap a lot of things that we put some time into and realize that, um, you know, God has our best interests in heart and we, we want to make sure that we are following his plan. <clears throat> All right, so let's go ahead and, and uh, I guess, finish up. Uh, it says, uh, so then you are no longer... Uh, strangers, uh, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, uh, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole building, being put together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. Um, just a couple things in closing um, that, that um, I, thought, I thought were important here. Uh, verse 19, it, it talks about being members of, of God's household. 
um, you know what a you know what a blessing uh, that 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 God has brought us the ability to, to or given us the um, option to be a part of His household. Um, you know, and, and I was thinking about, especially I, I think at the time that this was written, being a part of someone's household had had a very special meaning. Uh, usually came with a set of rights, um, some some uh, some maybe uh, security, uh, sort of a position of, of influence, and that's what God offers to us. Uh, not necessarily that we'll be influ influential uh, over others, but uh, the fact that you know God views us as that important, that He's that interested in us. And in uh, let's see, verse uh, twenty-one. Uh, it says, in him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Uh, you know, we, you are important. Uh, we are all important. Uh, everyone has a place. Um, you know, everyone uh, has a, a purpose uh, in the body of Christ. And in verse 22, it says, uh, uh, in him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. Uh, and so this is just kind of uh, leading in, I guess, to going back to what we were uh, talking about earlier today. You know, the, the Christian life isn't a solitary experience. Um, there's a lot of things that we can um, gain from each other, you know, strength, comfort, um, sharing, uh, you know, personal growth. Uh, there, there's just a, a lot of things that uh, God has, has, has uh, placed us with others. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something that, that we should be aware of. All right, it's good to be with you today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for um, being with us. Thank you for guiding us and, and help us, Lord, to, to understand your plan for us. We ask these things in your name. Amen.